So as Monica mentioned, I'll be talking about celestial holography. This is a newly emergent field that's rapidly growing. Uh, some of the questions that we are interested in here uh, date back half a century. Uh, there are various topics that have been researched 50, year, uh, 50 years ago or so that have not been connected at the time, but have now been connected in the recent years. And they have led to uh, new insights that have propelled this program, which goes under the name of celestial holography. Um, so there are various uh, insights from different areas of physics, coming from uh, quantum field theory scattering amplitude, from questions that you ask in GR about symmetries of spacetimes uh, and conserved charges, and uh, conformal field theory. And all these different, uh, different aspects in these different fields have come together and have been uh, connected uh, in, in, in various contexts, and they have fueled this program, which is about understanding uh, holography or quantum gravity in asymptotical flat space. So many of us are interested in understanding quantum gravity. In various space times. So in space times where we have a negative curvature in the city space, uh, we understand a lot about quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space-time, and in particular, we have learned a lot about uh, near-extremal black holes. At the opposite value of the cosmological constant, we have the Sitter space, which is important for cosmological questions. But then there's various scales in between uh, sources that highly curve space-time and uh, the scale at which we uh, have to take into account the expansion of the universe. And many physical processes in that scale in between are described well by asymptotically flat space-times. Now, a powerful tool for understanding quantum gravity in, uh, in these space-times is holography. which is the idea that quantum gravity on some manifold, M, has a dual description in terms of a field theory that lives on the boundary of the space-time. Now, for anti sitter space, the boundary here is time-like. Okay, um, so in, in the Sitter space, the boundary is time-like, and uh, we have uh, found uh, an explicit realization of this holographic principle, uh, and I have learned a lot about quantum gravity and notably about black holes. On the other hand, in asymptotically flat space times, the boundary is null, and this comes with various problems. So while in the Sitter space, we can write this nice cylinder, where time evolves and we have a field theory on the boundary, in asymptotical flat space, the asymptotic structure is much more difficult. So there's various points uh, at the conformal boundary of uh, asymptotically flat space times that have uh, special properties. And uh, the metric at the null boundary degenerates. So there's various issues that arise in asymptotically flat space that make it much harder to understand this holographic principle and uh, whether it applies. But in recent years, a lot of progress has been made. And the key to that is to, un to start with a basic question, which is look at the observables, the basic observables for quantum gravity in asymptotic flat space. And that is the S matrix. And the S matrix is a function of asymptotic data. So in particular, on-shell momenta. And so it already has some holographic flavor. So let's try to utilize it. What can it tell us? So I'm going to just motivate this now and then discuss in much more detail uh, everything that I write on the board. So if we consider scattering in asymptotical flat space time, we start with some uh, initial data at the past uh, timeline in, in, the, in, in the past, and then evolve it to the future. So we have some particles that come in from the past, then scatter, and then move out to the future. 
and they will hit the future uh, at a point on the sphere. And so the asymptotic, asymptotic data will be described by where these particles enter and exit um, on this two-dimensional sphere. And this is the two-dimensional sphere that if we point towards the night sky, we have a sphere at infinity. This is called the celestial sphere. Now, you might think that uh, each of these asymptotic data will be described by a different uh, two-dimensional sphere. But recent insights, and that comes from the last uh, couple of years, uh, have taught us that actually we should, we should think about the initial and the uh, final scattering data as living on the same celestial sphere. Let me draw this sphere. And then each of these incoming and outgoing particles uh, will be labeled by some points on this sphere. And then there will be some regions that describe the final data and some regions that describe the initial data. One other thing that comes in, in asymptotic flat space, in particular in four dimensions, is that the Lorentz group, which uh, the S matrix uh, uh, is a symmetry of, the Lorentz group is a symmetry of the S matrix. So the Lorentz group acts on this uh, two-dimensional celestial sphere as the global conformal group. And so the key insight uh, that has propelled a lot of the developments in the last couple of years is that um, if you write the S matrix, in four dimensions, in a new kind of basis that makes this fact that the Lorentz group acts as the conformal group manifest, then the S matrix can be shown to be equivalent to a correlation function on the sphere of some operators that I inserted at the points on the celestial sphere, which I will denote by W. Just a second, Monica, I'm just finishing writing the equation. And so this tells us that the S matrix in asymptotic flat space looks like a conformal correlator on the two-dimensional sphere at null infinity. And so the conjecture is that four-dimensional quantum gravity can be described by a two-dimensional, by a theory that lives on the two-dimensional celestial sphere. So we call this theory um, celestial CFT, conformal field theory, because of this property that the Lorentz group acts as the conformal group. Uh, sorry, Andrea. Yes. Uh, when you're saying that these theories all live on the same sphere at infinity, do you mean that you can just uh, use the translation operator along square plus to, to connect them, or do you mean something else? What I mean exactly by this statement will become clear in a, in, a few, uh, in a few moments. It has to do with understanding that to have a well-defined scattering problem, you need to um, know how fields that are defined at the past boundary and fields that are defined on the future boundary are related as you go uh, near this point, which is, which I will explain in a moment, is spatial infinity, and you need to know how these fields translate into each other. And that will tell us that they're not many spheres, but one sphere, and it will tell you how the scattering data is uh, matched. Hi. Asymptotically flat holography. Can we just move down one direction and make light simple? You mean do 3D? Um, yeah. Dynamics, but it's easier? Um, I don't know if it's easier. Uh, we know a lot about scattering amplitudes in four dimensions. We know a lot about the symmetries of asymptotically flat space in four dimensions. Um, and we know a lot about 2D CFT. Um, you would like to have a dictionary between 3D uh, observables and the 1D CFT. Um, you could think about that. Um, some things might be a bit singular, maybe. And one other thing is here that in four dimensions, four dimensions is very rich because we have infrared divergences. And um, a lot of the insights that, that come from that have been propelling this program. But you could, so this, this statement, um, the statement that of holography in asymptotic flat space is not restricted to four dimensions, uh, th this map from four to, four to two. Uh, in particular, um, 
the more general statement would be that quantum gravity in D dimensions is uh, uh, dual to some theory uh, that lives on a co-dimension two sphere. So here you could ask these questions. So some of the things like uh, discussing asymptotic symmetries, if you use a coordinate dependent uh, formulation, then they will depend on which dimensions you are in and could look very different in different dimensions. In so general, do you feel like 3D, 1D would be easier or harder? I feel maybe technically it would be simpler. But maybe conceptually less simple. I think conceptually it might be more tricky. But I haven't thought too much about that. Um, yeah, so. You're having something to say about the S matrix, so how would you be defining the, the S matrix in 3D where, uh, where the gravity doesn't propagate? Yeah, exactly. So conceptually it's, it sounds more tricky. We know it's rich enough that there's something going on. So in ADS, it's certainly um, there's plenty to, to, to learn. Um, I would just, without knowing so much about it, I would think 3D is so not completely trivial that this just evaporates as a, as a problem. And 1D CFT is a real thing too. So that, that's why I said. A lot of us like 2D CFTs. Yes. yes. And so <laughs> that's, that's one. Uh, I don't think you can define asymptotic scattering states in a you know, 1D, in, in three dimensions. I don't think you can define such states at all. Even in conformal free theories in four dimensions, you, can, you cannot define those. So I think that's the problem. And I think it's impossible to define asymptotic scattering states in a 3D, in a, in a, in 3D gravity. Without a boundary. I mean, without a, with certain types of boundaries, you mean, in this flat case. In, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, so, um, good. So here the statement was that um, there is a new basis for four-dimensional quantum field theory scattering in which the S matrix takes this form. Um, so apart from talking about holography and quantum gravity, um, this provides a new framework. And I think I should write bigger, right? I think it's bigger Okay. So this provides a new framework for uh, quantum field theory scattering. Because it recasts the S matrix in a basis where different kinds of symmetries become manifest. So in the original basis that's, uh, or in the basis that is typically used, which is uh, a plane wave basis, translation symmetry is manifest. But in this new basis, uh, the two-dimensional conformal symmetry uh, becomes manifest. And so uh, you can ask, uh, so certain problems will be well suited uh, for a certain basis. And so this provides a new way for asking uh, about uh, scattering processes. Um, where you utilize the fact that you have our conformal symmetry. Okay, um, and the last thing that I wanna say before uh, diving more deeply into this topic is that many of these uh, recent developments have uh, arisen from uh, the study of the very low energy sector of gravity in asymptotic flat space. And um, I'm sure most of you already have seen this drawing here. Um, maybe I'll should write it. Um, which relates different aspects of uh, the infrared uh, of gravity. So on the one corner, we have uh, what's called asymptotic symmetries. Of the asymptotic in flat space time, which it connects to uh, another uh, aspect uh, of infrared physics, which goes under the name of soft theorems. So these are universal behaviors of scattering amplitudes when you take the energy of an external mass as particle to zero. And then on the last corner of this uh, so-called infrared triangle uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, people who are interested in observables uh, care about, which is memory effects. And it turns out that these three different, a priori different distinct uh, topics are actually intimately connected. And I'm gonna discuss uh, some of the aspects of this triangle in today's lecture. Okay, 
Uh, and maybe let me finish by also mentioning some, uh, so there will be lecture notes for this course, but there already exist a couple of uh, lecture notes uh, which uh, you might find very useful. And so let me just uh, write down here some archive numbers for those. And in the meantime, if there are more questions, uh, you can ask them while I'm writing this. So the lecture notes about uh, about uh, different aspects of asymptotically flat spacetime. Um, uh, then lecture notes uh, in, in more in depth about uh, uh, how it builds up to the celestial holography um, um, principle. And then there are more recent lecture notes uh, that dive into the recent developments um, of this topic. So I'm not sure I'm getting right which is which, but I think this one is uh, by Indy Strominger, it's the, the book that he wrote about, uh, well, these relations. Um, this one is the advanced GR lecture notes by uh, Geoffrey Comper and Adrian uh, Fukiochi. And these two are recent lecture notes by Anna-Marie uh, Raclerio and um, Sabrina Bosterski, which uh, were given at certain uh, schools in the course of last, well, of this year. Okay. So now uh, I'm going to start by discussing some of the uh, physics that have led to uh, the celestial holography uh, program. So the first thing that I want to discuss is about soft theorems. And it will focus here on three-level gravitational uh, scattering. So in a, a gauge theory of gravity amplitude, there exist universal behaviors of the amplitudes when you have an additional um, gauge boson, so in this case a graviton, and you take the energy of that graviton to zero. So let me draw a picture here of a scattering amplitude of n particles labeled by the momenta p. And then one graviton whose momentum uh, came mu, so null momentum, um, which I parameterize by a scale, the energy, and the null vector q. And it also has a polarization vector, epsilon mu nu, with a plus or minus polarizations. Now the statement is that if I take here the energy of this graviton to zero, then the amplitude factorizes into one without that extra graviton and the prefactor. And this prefactor takes the following form for um, gravity three-level uh, scattering. There is a pole in the energy. Then there is what's called a soft factor, which depends on the helicities plus minus of the graviton whose energy we're taking to zero. And this will be an n-particle amplitude, so that's why the label n. Then there's a piece that's proportional to the energy to the zero. There's another, so another soft factor. And then there's order omega terms. And this is multiplied by the amplitude without that soft graviton. OK, so let me explain what these factors are. So the first one, S0, is given by the coupling, kappa, which is square root 32 pi g. And then a sum of all the hard particles that process from 1 to n. Given by this factor of the momenta dotted into the polarization tensor. Um, and then. Um, the momenta dotted into each other. And this is known as Weinberg's, so the soft theorem that involves only the leading term is called uh, Weinberg's soft graviton theorem. And this is uh, Weinberg's soft factor. This was done in the 60s. And normally, the energies are absorbed to the soft factor. So then this is called the Weinberg soft pore. And then the second um, universal piece in this uh, low energy expansion
is again given by a sum over all the hard momenta. But now the expression is quite more complicated. And this was only found very recently by Cachazo and Strominger. in 2014. So there's quite a bit of a gap between um, finding the leading uh, behavior in the soft limit and the subleading one. Okay, now let me explain what's in these formulas. So epsilon here is the polarization. Um, well, that's the polarization tensor, epsilon mu nu. And I'm picking a gauge such that I can write this as a product of two polarization vectors, um, which where the, the gauge that I pick is the transverse symmetric gauge. So this is zero, and the trace is also zero. Okay, so this is the polarization of the graviton. Um, P are the hard momenta. That's now the polarization vector that started into it. And Q is this null vector for the soft uh, graviton. And J here is the uh, total angular momentum. So that includes the orbital and spin part. And um, it's given by an operator acting on the remaining amplitude, um, which is just given by this expression in the momenta. It's anti-symmetric. And there's also uh, helicity terms um, if we're not talking about uh, scalar uh, hard particles in the remaining amplitude. Okay, so that's the statement uh, of uh, the soft graviton theorem. If you have an amplitude with n particles, one graviton, you take the energy of that graviton soft, then there's uh, universal pieces in this low energy expansion, and this, uh, these universal pieces are described by these uh, leading and subleading soft factors, um, which uh, contain the momentum of the hard particles and the angular momentum of the hard particles. So, sorry, Andrea, yes. in your formula, the epsilons are the tensor or the this vector? This is the vector. Those are the vectors. Yeah, this is also a vector. So um, I could have written it in with the polarization tensors, but it's quite convenient, and I will keep using this for most of the course, which makes uh, certain uh, structures uh, manifest. Can you also tell us the, um, so, um, how, how much are these uh, formula proven? So do they hold perturbatively yeah. to some loops, to non-perturbatively? Yes, so the leading one is universal. The subleading one gets a one loop correction, but it's one loop exact. So you, by universal, you mean non-perturbative? So both, both uh, actually, there's another term here, which is also universal. So that means it doesn't depend on the, uh, the particles, the other particles. Uh, the, the subleading term receives uh, loop corrections, but it's one loop exact. I see. So and so we'll so talk a bit more about that so later. So the first term, uh, does it hold to any order in perturbation theory or even non-perturbatively? Um, by which you mean? I'm so I'm talking here about perturbative uh, scattering amplitudes. OK, so, so, okay. So, so the first term holds to all orders in perturbation theory. And the second one is correct to three level. Mm -hmm. The one loop correction is known. And it's known also that there's no more corrections beyond one loop. I, is that the statement? Uh, yes, I believe that's the correct and, and then you're saying that there's some additional universal terms? Here there's another term um, which uh, I, I write, I'll have it in the lecture notes, but I'm not going to bother with it here. The so-called sub-subleading soft graviton theorem. The reason why I will not bother with it here now is that the first two uh, soft theorems, the, the leading and the subleading one, have an interpretation as asymptotic symmetries. Um, while the sub-subleading of graviton, the situation is a bit less clear. Well, actually quite a bit less clear. I, I see, but uh, so, so I, I presume uh, just from a scattering uh, amplitude point of view, so, so you have some S associated to that sub-subleading guy, mm -hmm. and, and that theorem is known, what, to three level, to one loop? To that is also known, so that was also in this paper here. Uh, okay. But I think it uh, is not one loop correct, uh, one loop exact. I, 
I, I see. So, so it's known to three level and it's not All of what I'm doing here on this uh, board is three level. And we can talk about uh, loop corrections, we can talk about multiple soft limits, because there's interesting stuff that happens when you don't only take one graviton to, to well, or, or other theories to zero. Uh, and then uh, in some cases it depends on the order which, in which you take it to zero. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, this will not be the main focus of uh, the course, so I will just focus on uh, the most important uh, aspects of these soft theorems and will then explain how they are related to other important aspects that will be relevant for the celestial holography uh, program. Andrea? Yes, I have a Joseph. question. The leading term, uh, the omega to the minus one, yeah. what's the interpretation of that? Because if you have an amplitude which is finite, this will look like it goes up. Yes. I'm just trying to get some intuition. Where does the why do you have a divergent term as omega goes to zero? Because yeah, so, you know, yeah, so, I have nothing as omega goes to zero. The so, graviton is. Limited. So if you multiply this whole amplitude by the energy of that graviton, then this is the only term that remains, and this term we will see later um, will be. Uh, you can write this term. So this is then a universal uh, factorization of this amplitude, and this this term. So here you have an insertion of a soft graviton, which you can then write as the amplitude without the graviton times something. And that something we will interpret later as uh, a word identity for an asymptotic symmetry. And that asymptotic symmetry will be, uh, as a teaser, will be a BMS super translation symmetry. Mm -hmm. so, but, but the divergence is coming, I mean, the, the physical quantity, if I, try, if I want to calculate scattering and, you know, mm -hmm. I want to go to NFT and, you know, to look at what's going on, the physical quantity is the amplitude or is it the amplitude times the energy? I'm just curious, why, no, is, why so, is the, I mean, so, it's, it's a stupid question, why is the amplitude diverging as omega goes to zero? So you have propagators in that diagram. So what you do here is you look at all the Feynman diagrams and then you look at what happens uh, when omega goes to zero and you have propagators and there will be a one over energy in the propagator. So if I had written mm -hmm. it not with the omega out here, which is normally what it, how it's done, but if I had written k here instead of q, then this soft factor would just come from uh, a pole that arises when, uh, when you have, uh, well, uh, the propagator where p is dotted into k. So oh, okay, okay. the pole is the pole which appears yeah. when the pole in there. And okay. you use the, the LSC formalism, you, you amputate legs. So I didn't want to go into the details of this here, but uh, this is how. Yeah, no, 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 it's the pole. When two legs are collinear, you know, this is, this is, it's a divergent. It's, so it's there's, a divergent. Col yeah, there's collinear limits and there's soft limits. They're not quite the same. Um, so here, the, the, this factorization really comes from a soft limit where you take the energy to zero, not so much uh, when p dot q. Uh, mm -hmm when P and Q are uh, collinear. Um, but, but yeah, so there's a lot of uh, stuff going on there. Um, I did not want to make this the main uh, focus okay. of the talk, no, but good. just I use, okay. use, like it, okay. use as an introduction to um, stuff that comes later. Yes. Quick question. Does this one loop exactness have an anomaly interpretation from the entry point of view? Can you repeat that? Or can you hear it, Yosef? Yes. Oh, does the one loop exactness of the subleading term have an anomaly interpretation? Maybe we come back uh, to that question in the next lecture when we discuss more about uh, the symmetry interpretation of this object and uh, its relation to the 2D stress tensor. Okay. So I think I have one more blackboard that I can use. So let me just, uh, so we will not derive uh, where this comes from. Um, you can find this in a textbook by Weinberg. Um, what I will do instead is do a quick uh, consistency check um, uh, for uh, these soft factors. And that is by looking at whether these uh, expressions are gauge invariant. Okay, so that means if we shift the polarization tensor um, by something that's proportional to Q. And let me do a symmetric combination. Um, then uh, we should find that uh, the original amplitudes goes to itself plus a term and that term should better vanish. And this is so because uh, we have Q square equals zero and we have uh, Q dotted into epsilon mu nu uh, zero. So epsilon is only defined uh, up to shifts by Q, and so the amplitude should not uh, depend on, on that. 
So let's look at that. So let's look at the first uh, term, the, the first soft factor, Weinberg soft factor. And we shift epsilon uh, to epsilon plus lambda q. Then what happens is we recover the original expression. And uh, let me set cap over to, uh, to 1 for, for, for this uh, uh, purpose here. Then I will have a sum over all the n momenta. I have a term where p is dotted into this uh, extra term lambda. Um, then a p that's dotted into q. And so we see that, maybe I'll write this color, the pole, the, this term here that will, would give us the, the pole if I had written q in terms of k, so that's that term, um, goes away. And so we are only left with the original amplitude plus um, lambda dotted into the sum uh, over all the momenta of the hard particles. And this is zero by energy momentum conservation. And so energy momentum conservation makes uh, guarantees that these amplitudes and the soft factorization is gauge invariant. Now what about the subleading soft factor? Do the same thing. This becomes, and let me write this with an I here so I don't have to write it uh, in the shifted term. Okay, so here it's a bit more complicated. So uh, first we have uh, a term that has the following structure. There's p dotted into lambda, and there's q dotted into j dotted into q over p dotted into q. And then there's another term that's q lambda dotted into the sum over all the j's. OK, so the first term uh, vanishes because j is anti-symmetric. And then the second term here is angular momentum conservation. So this is 0 by angular momentum conservation. OK, and um, I've talked about uh, gravity here, but one can also do this for gauge theory, where uh, we could replace uh, cap over 2 by the charge E, and we replace uh, the momenta by uh, the, the charges Q of the hard particles. And what we will find then here is that charge conservation guarantees gauge invariance of the amplitude. Um, and we can also add color, and then the statement would be color charge conservation. And that would be related to the soft uh, gluon theorem. So here we see that there is an interplay between um, taking uh, soft limits and conservation laws for the total conserved quantities in the process. And what we'll see in the following is that actually these soft theorems are hiding much more. They're hiding not only total energy and total uh, angular momentum conservation, but these conservation laws should hold at every angle. And because you can pick infinitely many angles, there will be an infinity of these uh, conservation laws for every angle. And that um, then connects to the other corners of this triangle. So can you see these uh, infinite conservation laws directly from gauge invariance? No, no, no. So uh, here, uh, the gauge invariants are just used to, to show that, okay, if the, uh, if the amplitude is gauge invariant, then uh, so the, uh, the conservation law guarantees gauge invariance, but there are more conservation laws than the one that I just discussed. Yeah, I guess the question was, uh, can, can you get more mileage from just gauge invariance? and find about the disconservation laws without ever having to connect it to asymptotic. So we're going to talk about uh, certain kinds of gauge symmetries, but not trivial gauge symmetries, but uh, ones that are physical. Is that what you are uh, getting at? Um, no, actually, I don't know what I'm getting <laughs> Then I'm not sure how I should answer the question. <laughs> Hard to. So he, this was uh, a motiv to, to motivate that um, soft theorems and conservation laws are tightly connected. But the statement is not that we have total uh, energy conservation, say, and 
and that, that's related to soft firms. There's more than just that. And this is one of what we're gonna discuss next. So the statement is that soft firms are related to conservation laws where there are infinitely many, not just one overall, which would be the total energy conservation. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, then um, in order to uh, dive deeper into uh, the infrared physics and what these conservation laws, uh, these infinitely many conservation laws mean, um, we have to talk about the uh, structure, the asymptotic structure of Minkowski space on which we're doing this scattering. So the next point is asymptotic structure. of Minkowski space. Okay, so there are various coordinate systems that I will be using throughout the course. Um, one is Cartesian coordinates, so let me just be very explicit and uh, set up the notation and write everything down in detail. Uh, another one is spherical coordinates. where omega two is the uh, two sphere given by the angles theta and phi. And then I will be using uh, coordinates that are more suited to discussion of what the asymptotic structure of Minkowski space is and what uh, the causal structure is. And so in order to, so this is, these coordinate systems are very nice for certain questions, um, but they're not very good at knowing uh, about causal motion and they're not well suited for uh, discussing the physics near the boundary of asymptotic flat space. So the first thing to do uh, in order to get there is to introduce null coordinates, which make much more manifest the ca causal motion. Um, so we have u, which is given by t minus r. This is called the retarded time. And we have v, which is t plus r, called advanced time. Am I writing big enough now for the in-person audience? Good, um, so the, these coordinates have ranges uh, where u and v go between minus infinity and plus infinity, and u is smaller than v. Um, and in, this, in these new coordinates, the metric uh, looks like this. Okay, so that's very, very good because now we know how, uh, we know a bit more about uh, causal motion because these describe uh, null lines. But uh, these are still infinite and what we would like to do is we would like to bring this infinity to a finite distance and then utilize the power of Penrose diagrams in uh, discussing um, the physics and the, in particular uh, causal structure of the space time. So to do this, we introduce new coordinates that make the range finite. So we take u to be the tangent of another coordinate, couple u, and v the same. And now the coordinates capital U and v, they range between minus pi over two and plus pi over two, still with the condition that u is smaller or equal than v. Okay, so now the line element takes the following form. There's a prefactor, that's one of a cosine squared uh, u, cosine squared v, multiplying um, minus four du dv plus sine squared u minus v, the omega two squared. Okay, so here we have out front uh, something that uh, is infinite at the, well, that is infinite at the boundary, but we can rescale um, this whole metric by multiplying by this, uh, the inverse of this factor. And that new metric is then what will describe for us a compactified Minkowski space. Um, it will also be useful to introduce another set of coordinates where uh, we introduce new time-like uh, and radial coordinates. So 
let me call capital T the combination of U and V, and capital R the combination of V minus R. T will then be between minus pi and plus pi, and R will be between 0 and pi. Sorry? Thank you. And then the metric, let me just write omega minus 2 of t and r. And then it's given by minus dt square plus dr square plus sine square r d omega 2 square, where this piece here is locally a three sphere. And this whole metric uh, we understand to be conformal to a patch of R times S3. So once we remove this uh, conformal factor by rescaling it, um, the metric will be uh, compactified into a finite range. And we can draw this um, on a cylinder where time goes in this direction. We have plus pi here, minus pi here. R is, let me put it, uh, R equals pi over here, and R equals 0 over there. And then let me draw this finite range on the cylinder. And let me give these special points here names. So let me call this here i0, this i plus, and this i minus. And um, let me maybe denote r goes in this way. And it's 0 here and pi over there. OK. So in these coordinates, it becomes clear that the Minkowski space, um, once I remove the conformal factor, um, gets mapped into this finer region. And there are special points that appear in these diagrams, which we will now discuss. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Yes, each point here is a two-sphere. And I will talk much more about the two-sphere in a moment. Let me just write down also the ranges of the coordinates. So, well, I guess I've written it. Um, so r goes from 0 to pi. And then the restriction to this uh, funny shape comes from uh, the relation um, t plus r smaller than pi. OK. So now we are ready to talk about the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space, which takes the following form. So we have this triangle because of this relation here, which uh, let me write it maybe also in these original null coordinates, the capital U and capital V, um, just as a reminder. So minus pi over 2 is smaller than U, which is smaller or equal than V, which is smaller than plus pi over 2. OK? Um, T uh, goes up and R goes to the right. And these boundaries here on the side are the directions of u, uh, v, down here, and u up here. And um, v is plus pi over 2 up here, and u goes in the range that I have essentially written here, minus pi over 2 plus pi over 2. And for this lower part of the, uh, the side length here, uh, u is minus pi over 2 and v goes from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. OK, so these capital U and V coordinates um, are finite, and the range from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. Uh, let me also write where t and r sit in this diagram. So t is mi minus pi here and plus pi here. And r equals 0 is here along this line. And r equals pi is here. 
And now the special points that I have drawn here, maybe I put them in color. So these special points here, this is I minus, I plus, and let me use a different color for I zero. And then we can also draw in this diagram uh, in the original coordinates that we had in the very beginning, T and R. We can draw lines of constant T and constant R. So these are lines of constant R. And these are lines of constant T. Okay, and at every point in this diagram, there is a two-sphere. Any questions on this Penrose diagram while I erase the boards? Andrea? Yes? Is I0 also a two-sphere? No. I zero, I plus, I minus, those are points. The other side lengths that I haven't given a name yet, which are parameterized by U and V, they are surfaces. Okay, so I zero, I plus, I minus points. Um, but these points are single and we'll come uh, to that in a moment. Um, and these lines, let me draw them in blue, which are called scry plus and scry minus. They are called null infinity and they are surfaces. And the Topology of the surfaces is, is R times S2. But um, let me talk a bit uh, in more detail about all these different regions. So that answers the question, I guess. OK, so let me talk about the special points here. So we have I plus, we have I minus. Um, these are called time-like future and past infinity. And they are reached by taking t to infinity, so the original coordinate, and r fixed. And similarly, uh, past time like infinity is taken, is obtained by taking t to minus infinity and holding r fixed. Then we have this uh, special pound point out here, i zero, which is called spatial infinity. And it is obtained by taking r to infinity while holding t fixed. And then we have these surfaces in between, scry plus and scry minus. Scry plus is called future null infinity. And scry minus is called past null infinity. And they are obtained by taking r to infinity while keeping u fixed for the future and r to infinity keeping v fixed. Andrea, stupid question uh, in, uh, related to Bogdan's question. I mean, you know, if I, if I stay in R4 and uh, if I stay in our, in our space time and I, I, I go to a fixed radius, so I have like, you know, a 20 kilometer a circle, and then I take t to infinity, this should remain a circle. It shouldn't, it shouldn't shrink to zero. It shouldn't become a point. Ah. So, the, so when you say that i plus is a point and I'm, i zero is a point and so on and so forth, you know, if I just, if I just, I mean, if I just go to 20 kilometers, I look at a 20 kilometer circle, 
I keep R fixed, my circle is still 20 kilometers, and I go all the way to infinity. I let time go to the end of the to the end of time. That circle is finite size. Why would that be Wait, a point? Confirm a manifold, right? Yeah. So we have compactified Minkowski space to this finite uh, range, where uh, this is finite in the the capital U and V coordinates. Um, but I should say, in the small u and v coordinates, these points are still reached in, uh, well, for, for infinite values. So as you go back here, v goes to minus infinity, v goes to plus infinity, and as you come from here, u goes to minus infinity as you go to spatial infinity, and u goes to plus infinity here. In these couple of coordinates, we have compactified this, and this is all a finite range. And it's a compactified guy, it's not a few. So, here, so this Penrose diagram comes from uh, taking the metric well, taking the space time to a finite distance. And here we have uh, rescaled out this conformal factor. Oh, and we're okay. just it's ending it's with this patch it's that's it's conformal to R cross S3. OK, so, so, so it's the rescaling actually. So if I, have, if I have a 20 kilometer circle, the 20 kilometer circle, if I look in the, if I multiply by the omega, then it will actually go to zero size. So it will become a point. OK, so welcome back for those who are remote. Uh, the technical problems have been resolved. There will be no more closed time like curves. And we we'll continue now with um, unpacking uh, the Penrose diagram that I've shown here to make a bit more clear where the two sphere sits. Um, and also, I would like to uh, talk a bit about um, how, how particles um, behave in the space time. So I've drawn here now a full diamond where the U and V coordinates parameterize these side lengths, and uh, past time like infinity and future time like infinity are at these uh, bottom and top corners, and spatial infinity I0 is out here. And then these, uh, the connecting surfaces here are square minus and square plus, past and future null infinity. And um, in this diagram, um, what happens is that the two sphere is now described by a pair of points, one on the left to, to R equals zero, and one on the right. Um, so let me draw one point here with an X and another one with the dot. So this will be respectively the North Pole and South Pole of the two sphere. So if I draw a two sphere in full, this minus two, and I have the South Pole with an X and the North Pole with a dot. And so this is how um, it relates in the Penrose diagram. So I've drawn here um, a two sphere. Um, it's a bit misleading because there lo looks to be also a two sphere at I0, but I0, as we discussed before, um, is given by a point um, where R equals zero and pi correspond to the north and south poles of the sphere. And another thing that I would like to mention about uh, square plus minus, which we said is, is given topologically by R cross S2, has actually an induced metric that is the generate. Um, it's zero, zero times, so this is the times, um, d or dv plus the two sphere. And so this brings in various uh, intricate uh, issues that do not arise in, in other asymptotically, in other uh, space times. Okay, so um, to look at how particles move in the space time, uh, massive particles start out at past time like infinity and move up to future time like infinity. Massless particles travel at 45 degree angles from uh, past null infinity to future null infinity. Uh, let me write this here. Yeah, massless and massive. And uh, I will also denote here uh, the boundaries of null infinity. So that's crime minus when the, the coordinate v, the null coordinate v goes to minus infinity, we have scry minus plus. You say it's hard to see? Yeah. Okay. Better? Yeah. Then uh, the future of past null infinity is denoted scry, uh, so sorry, this is scry minus minus. And the future of past null infinity is scry minus plus. And then similarly for uh, future null infinity, the past boundary is scry plus minus and the future boundary is scry plus plus. Okay. And um, again, the two sphere is given by a pair of points. 
Now, another thing that I want to mention here is that these points, uh, fields can become multi-valued at this point. So one way to resolve these singularities is by choosing a nice slicing near those uh, special points. So let me draw uh, this diamond uh, shaped Penrose diagram again, where I minus a zero right plus. And let me also draw the light cone at u equals zero and v equals zero. And a good slicing to resolve issues near, uh, sorry, this is I plus, near future and past time like infinity is given by choosing a hyperbolic slicing, which looks something like this. So this is Euclidean ADS3. And then for resolving um, issues happening uh, near I0, we choose another such slicing, which is given by uh, three-dimensional Sitter slices. And these slicings are also used, so they're useful for uh, discussing um, what happens in the holographic context for massive particles that come in at past non-infinity and go at the future non-infinity. And we can also use the uh, already established uh, ADS3 CFT2 dictionary to learn something about uh, um, import some technology from ADS50 into celestial holography. Okay. And now the last thing that I want to talk about is now that we have understood um, the causal structure and Penrose diagram of Minkowski space, um, now I want to set up the scattering problem and come back to uh, the matching condition that I mentioned in the very beginning. Okay, so uh, classically what we need to do is we need to find a map that uh, takes uh, us from the phase space on past null infinity to the phase space on future null infinity. In the quantum scattering problem, we need to find the S matrix that evolves states defined on, past, uh, on the past boundary to states that are uh, described by the data on the future boundary. Um, and let me, for this purpose, draw this uh, diagram again. So we have stuff that comes in, does something, and goes back out. And we want to find a way to map the initial data to the final data. And so what we need to understand here is what happens near this special point I0. Um, and in particular, what happens when we take fields to the past boundary of future null infinity and fields on the future uh, boundary of past null infinity. So what happens in this region? Sorry, and I'll come back to my first question. So what you're saying, uh, I, I guess it's assuming that you have a way to just go along sky minus with mm -hmm. some, yes. you know, V Hamiltonian along sky plus. So yes. this is how you relate all these spheres on sky plus and sky minus. And this is why the problem is only reduced to understanding what happens at I zero, how you relate these two. Yes. The, the, uh, the other two are sort of trivial, uh, well, not so trivial. Well, since the data is defined at the boundary, we will, we, what we need is we need to relate the data at the boundary. A boundary of what? Well, the boundary of the, p the past to the boundary of the future. So uh, as you, okay, so when we set up the scattering problem, since we're looking at gravity, we will look at um, metrics that go not to exactly flat space, but to asymptotically flat space. These metrics will then be described by uh, certain data, radiative data, and we need to understand how the radiative data at past non-infinity matches to that at uh, future non-infinity. And this data will, in particular, you will do an, uh, one of our expansion, and then this data will depend on the null coordinates that parameterize the null boundary and the angles on the sphere. And then we have to understand how, these, how the leading terms in this expansion, namely given by this function, how they uh, map to each other as we go from along scry minus to scry plus, passing through I0. Okay, so let me start by uh, writing down the coordinate systems that we now finally will use in order to describe physics near the past boundary and physics near the future boundary. So we already saw that there is this null coordinate U that parameterizes um, future null infinity. And note that I will be now writing down the metrics in the small U and V coordinates, which have infinite range. So this is the physical metric. So Minkowski space, in these retarded coordinates 
is given by this expression. And a two sphere, which I'll now write in suitable coordinates. I'll explain in a second what that is. And then at past non infinity, the same, but now with retarded time. So I've chosen here coordinates uh, that take uh, the usual angles theta and phi to uh, stereographic coordinates z and z bar, where uh, this gamma zz here is the unit metric on the two sphere, which is given by uh, this explicit expression in the coordinates z z bar. And I think I should not use uh, this side of the diagram, so let me move over here to explain uh, what these new angles are. So these are stereographic coordinates. So let me attempt to draw this picture. So this is the complex plane. And now I do a stereographic projection where I have the North Pole here the south pole down here. The original angle theta in the two sphere um, is this. And then, okay. by doing a stereographic projection, the angle theta over two is down there. And so, the new coordinates, z, will be related to the old coordinates, uh, theta and phi, which I've not drawn here, but here there's a point that's theta and phi, um, by what is the tangent of theta over 2 e to the i phi, and z bar in uh, the signature that I've chosen, the 1,3 signature, will be the complex conjugate. And so in this diagram, let me um, point out uh, special points. So here the north pole, which is theta equals zero, will be given by z equals zero. The south pole, which is given by uh, theta equals pi, is given by z equals infinity. And then uh, the point here on the equatorial plane will be given by z z bar equals to one, where theta equals pi over two. Okay, so, so much oh, sorry, for- Sorry, it's not very clear from your diagram. So, so the Normally, one makes this uh, stereographic sphere uh, touch the complex plane. So, for you, it touches it at the north pole, or the the angle theta equals zero uh, will be the north pole, and theta equal pi is the is the, okay. is the south pole. And then a point theta phi will be given uh, in the complex plane by this expression. The north pole is not z, z bar equal to zero, z equal to zero, sorry. No, the north pole is z equals to zero and z bar equals to zero. The south pole is z equals infinity. Uh, sorry, z and z, z bar are coordinates on the complex plane? Yeah, that's so, what so I'm So then uh, the north pole touches the complex yes. plane at the origin. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not very clear from the diagram. I'm sorry for my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for my uh, we, drawing we skills. We require our speakers to have uh, amazing drawing abilities. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now let me get back to here. Um, so now that we've introduced these coordinates z and z bar, let me also tell you how this relates back to uh, the original uh, Cartesian coordinates that we started in the very beginning, which is uh, to remind you the retarded coordinates t minus r. r square is just xi squared. And then uh, z can be expressed as x1 plus i x2. Um, divided by x3 plus r. And then for the pass boundary, v is t plus r, r square equals xi, xi, and z equals minus x3 plus r, or x1 minus i, x2. Okay, so these coordinates are going to describe the physics in the future boundary. 
And in particular, since um, if you, the future boundary is reached by taking r to infinity and holding u, z, and set bar fixed, this means that if we go out uh, that way, we go out along uh, null rays, where because u du, z, and dz bar equals zero, so the s square equals zero, and so this gives us a nice way to uh, now do a one of our expansion of all the fields uh, in the scattering problem. Then when we go to the past boundary, u goes to minus infinity, so these coordinates will no longer be good to describe what happens in the past boundary, and so we introduce this, uh, which, these coordinates where we replace u by v. And then uh, the thing that I mentioned earlier about uh, the need to identify what happens to the fields as they approach uh, these boundaries that uh, meet at I zero um, is we need a matching condition to make the scattering problem well defined. And this matching condition, um, if you try to uh, evaluate the fields and just set them equal, say that they're equal at, the, at scry minus plus and scry plus minus, then this doesn't work because this matching condition would not be a Lorentz invariant. Um, so what was proposed by uh, Stromanger in 2013 is that you should use a matching condition, which is called antipodal matching, which relates points uh, uh, z in the past to the antipodal points in the future. So the antipodal map is that goes to mi one, minus one over z bar. And it tells you in this diagram here that as you move along generators on a past boundary, cross to I zero and then move again along generators of future infinity, you're using the same coordinate. So the same, so you, you label uh, the, the, the angles that stay constant along the generators on the null boundary by the same uh, uh, name Z. And you can see this from the way that uh, these coordinates relate back to Minkowski space because you can clearly see that um, the angular coordinates at the past boundary given by this expression is minus one over the complex conjugate on the future. So this is the way how this antipolar matching is uh, built into this here. And it's what is needed in order to make the scattering problem well defined. Okay, are there any questions? You mentioned something about Lorentz invariants and the, uh, sorry, what, what was the comment? Yeah, so the, 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 the comment was that um, not, you cannot just pick any kind of matching condition because it will break Lorentz and CPT symmetry. But the antipodal matching condition preserves it. And maybe it is the only one that preserves that, but the statement is it's a matching condition that preserves CPT. I'm sorry, how can symmetry. I see that? Uh... Okay, I, you can see that. Um, I can give this as an exercise. Um, they, it's explained in uh, Stromanger's lecture notes where you take, um, you look at say moving, uh, charged particles moving in the space time and you look at the potential that describes that which is the linear Dvichet potential and then you describe to make sense of a scattering problem and you will see that the, an anti that the antipodal matching uh, is sort of built into this um, to make it well defined. I mean this, we could spend another half hour discussing about about this, I did not plan on doing so. Um, this is a matching condition that makes the scattering problem well defined and using that um, we can move on and talk about uh, how to map uh, data from past null infinity to data future null infinity, setting up the scattering problem and talking about what the symmetries are of the S matrix in the quantum version of this problem um, that uh, leave uh, what, what are the, the symmetries of the, of the gravitational uh, S matrix? Sorry, without going into full detail on it, which I don't want to do either, um, can you explain the minus sign? I mean, why the antipodal? Just a little more about what this is. I think I did that here, no? So we have written down uh, future, the, the metric of Minkowski space in the future null infinity and the past null infinity and how it relates back to the original uh, Minkowski uh, coordinates, which uh, I write down the, if I write down the Minkowski metric, I just write down one metric with, with uh, x mu coordinates, and then I uh, choose different coordinates as I go to the boundaries. And these different coordinates uh, have uh, the angles related by um, this uh, antipodal map. And from this, you don't see anything about the scattering problem here because I haven't talked about that yet. 
Um, but uh, this is the condition that you have to put in in order for, uh, in order to, so this relates to the question of how many spheres are there. Um, you could think, oh, I have my data at the past boundary, which uh, is, one, is one sphere, and then the future data at the future boundary, which is another sphere. Um, but that is not correct. Um, if you want to, so if we're now talking about the symmetries of the space time, uh, you can have symmetries, exact symmetries of the space time, and you can have symmetries that, are, that only hold uh, near the boundaries of the space time, so called asymptotic symmetries. And then if you had two spheres, you would say I have an asymptotic symmetry uh, that is related to the past boundary and one to the future boundary. And you would think mm, your S matrix is invariant under, uh, uh, under the, the, the combined uh, uh, asymptotic symmetry group. But that's not the case. Um, it's only invariant under a certain subgroup of that, and that certain subgroup um, is related to uh, the fact that you don't have just you don't have two spheres, but you have one sphere. Uh, you ha you use this matching condition, and uh, this will give you a subgroup uh, which is a symmetric group of gravitational scattering. correct rephrasing of what you're saying, just the fact that I can see this uh, Minkowski space as some sort of two-sphere fibered over the TR plane. And if I, if I want to, to make sense of this, then uh, I have to go through the singular point in the particular way that, that you mentioned. Um, yeah, or maybe phrasing it differently. Um, the conformal compactification already gives us a hint of what the matching should be. You want to go along uh, generators al along scry minus, pass through I zero, and go out to uh, to the uh, and continue along uh, scry plus, and that that tells you you should label the the angle coordinates which are constant along the longer generators by the same uh, by the same z, and that's what this does. Andrea? Yes? Is this related in a way to the fact that in the conformally compactified time, I0 is a single point, mm -hmm. whereas before we conformally compactified, in fact, going to spatial infinity can be done in many different ways. Because if you start from a point somewhere inside the book, you can go along different angles to I+. plus. So in the physical space time, it's not really yes. a point. You have to give some extra condition at I0 that reflects this fact. Yeah. And uh, also, um, we would like to have, uh, when, when you go through I0, we would like to have some continuity. And that continuity is given to you by this uh, particular matching condition. Thank you. So you want fields uh, to be continuous along uh, this path going from square minus to square plus via I0. Did you say this was a unique matching? No. Um, I raised the question that maybe it's a unique one, but I don't know of a proof. Okay, so uh, with this matching condition, um, a light ray that uh, starts at the past boundary and the future boundary will end at the same point. I mean, will be labeled by the same uh, Z, but it will be at antipolar points. And now, it, so it will have the same value of Z at minus infinity and plus, uh, not, uh, future non infinity um, be, be from the way that I've uh, set up the problem. Okay, so now that we have talked about uh, Minkowski space, the causal structure, and the matching condition, we are finally uh, in uh, the, at the stage where we can talk about asymptotically flat space times and uh, gravitational scattering. So we can add gravity to the picture, and so we need to. Uh, know what happens so the space time can do something in the middle but we still want the, the, the final state after everything has happened um, to settle down in an asymptotically flat uh, space time so that we can expand around uh, Minkowski space near the, the boundary of the space time but we need to understand what uh, are the possible boundary conditions that we can have going beyond Minkowski space. So um, a useful way to think about this is to talk a little bit more about uh, light rays and null surfaces. So what we're going to consider is we consider a family of null surfaces. Um, labeled by uh, constant u. 
Then we look at the normal uh, to these null hypersurfaces and And the condition that the hypersurface is null uh, means that the norm um, has to vanish. So this is given by g mu nu, d nu u, d mu u. So this is g u u, so this should be 0. So that's the first thing that we want to uh, keep. We want the metric component uh, related to g u with upstairs indices to be 0. Um, then we uh, look at the transverse two-sphere whose uh, angular coordinates are labeled by z sub bar. So let me denote this by xa, which is z and z bar. And we want to keep that constant um, along the null rays. So that means m mu d mu xa should vanish. And this is given by g mu nu d mu u d mu xa. And so this means that g u a is zero. We want to keep that. And then finally, we take the, the radial coordinate r um, to be so-called luminosity distance, which means that we fix um, the r of the determinant of the metric on this two-sphere, which I denote by g a b, divided by r square, to be zero. And what that gives us then are the so-called von de Sachs coordinates. U R Z Z bar, or um, uh, it's also called bond de gauge, the condition that I've written here on the metric components. And if I pull down the indices uh, to to make uh, lower indices, these conditions will be that G R R downstairs is zero, and G R A equals zero. So we wanna. I want our asymptotically flat metric uh, to preserve this gauge um, in order to preserve this uh, light-like structure. So this means that our metric should take the following form. There's a UU component. There's a UR component. And then we have a component that mixes U and the angles. and the angular components. Can you still see this? Okay, so the, uh, comparing this back to the Minkowski metric, we see that uh, asymptotically flat spacetimes, um, they uh, have metric components turned on that uh, we also have in the uh, Minkowski space, and these metrics preserve the uh, causal structure of Minkowski space. And so they admit a large R expansion, so an expansion in one over R, which we will utilize. Okay. Uh, we which we will we'll utilize now in order to determine what these uh, metric components GUU, GUR, GUA, and GAB should be. Okay, so um, what this entails is finding good boundary conditions. And this is usually very tricky business because what we need to do is we need to find um, boundary conditions, so how these metric components fall off at large R, which allow physically interesting situations. For example, we would like to include um, gravitational waves uh, that reach the boundary. So in that case, we cannot just fix these metric components to be that of Minkowski space. We need to allow something more. But if we um, choose boundary conditions on these metric components that are too relaxed, we might get zero energy in the space time. So we don't want that. So this is a tricky business. And um, it uh, has a long history. And I will just uh, give you the result for uh, what a good set of boundary conditions for these metric components uh, is. And this is due to the seminal work of Bondi, Van der Boek, Metzner, and Sachs, who um, thought about these questions in the 60s. Um, no, I think you can erase it. Thank you. OK. so. I will just give you um, what they wrote down as good boundary conditions for asymptotically flat spacetimes. So the first line that I'm writing here, you will recognize it as the original Minkowski metric, 
to which we're now adding extra terms. So we're adding a one of our term to the u, the u square piece. We are adding a dz square term. And then we're adding a bunch of more terms. And we're adding this du dz, dz term and uh, the complex conjugate terms as well. So in particular, there's also dz bar term, dz bar square term, and the du dz bar term. And then dot, 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 which would be subleading terms. OK, so let me um, write this out uh, in terms of the boundary conditions for these metric components that we have written over there. So here, the boundary condition would be that in addition to the minus 1, which is for the Minkowski metric, I have a term that's order r to the minus 1. For the metric component GUR, I get a minus 1 plus an order 1 over r square. Um, the GUZ component is order 1. The GZZ component is order r. And the GZZ bar component, which has as the leading term the uh, metric on the two sphere, gamma z z bar, also has an order one piece. And then uh, we have the gauge conditions that GRR equals zero and GRA equals zero. And these are uh, satisfied exactly, while these um, are an expansion in one of R. So all these metric components depend on u, r, z, z bar. We expand them in these terms. And then in the metric itself, we have now these, uh, these terms, m, zzz, and nz. And these depend on u, z, and z bar. So let me give some names. So m is called the Bondi mass aspect. Z here is called uh, gravitational data. or shear, and n is called the angular momentum aspect. So m, so usually this is also denoted with an index b, but I'll be using a, a, a and b as indices that denote the angles on a two-sphere, so I'll, I'll just omit it. So m and n um, are angular densities at future null infinity or for, of respectively the energy and angular momentum, as the names tell. Uh, Z here is traceless. So gamma AB, CAB equals zero. And that comes from um, this other condition here um, that uh, sets uh, R to be the luminosity distance. Now, um, this piece is quite interesting. This describes the radiative data at uh, null infinity. And from it, one constructs the so-called Mu's tensor, which is denoted um, NAB. And this is the change of CAB uh, in the time that parameterizes uh, the null boundary. And this so-called Mu's tensor measures for you the flux across null infinity. And in a sense, it's the, uh, the gravitational analog of the uh, Maxwell field strength, which in these coordinates would be uh, fuz equals duaz. And so this is the uh, gravitational analog. OK, so all the functions that are wrote here are functions of u, z, and z bar, but not all of, can, not all of them can be specified freely uh, at null infinity. Yes. Uh, it's, oh, it's symmetric. It's symmetric and it's traceless, yeah. Um, and it's, it therefore contains two polarizations and those are the two polarizations of the graviton. So this uh, describes for you gravitational waves. Okay, the, uh, maybe I should say NAB squared describes um, the flux, the energy flux. 
Okay. Um, so not all of them can be specified freely at the null boundary, only uh, the gravitational data can be specified freely, while M and N are related uh, or are constrained via Einstein's equations. So um, we haven't said anything about the equations of motion yet. I've just set up uh, the uh, asymptotic expansion of future null infinity, and there is a similar one for uh, past null infinity. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to also have this uh, space-time uh, satisfy Einstein's equations. For some uh, matter, Pm. And then uh, we also, since we now we imposed a fall-off on the metric, we should also impose uh, fall-off conditions for, um, for the matter fields. Um, I don't think it's uh, worth uh, taking the time now uh, listing all of them. Uh, just as an example, TUU should fall off as one over R squared, and then all, all, the, all the components here have certain fall off conditions. Um, for example, the analog thing, which takes me less time to say for the electromagnetic field, would be to take um, the uh, 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 FUZ component uh, to a constant, the uh, FUR component to go like one over R squared, and these boundary conditions will uh, ensure that I don't have uh, infinite uh, energy uh, across uh, the boundary. And, and similarly, similarly here. So okay. Andrea, I, ha I have a couple of questions. So, so this form of the metric, is it true that you don't even need to use the constraints in order to, to fix this form? Um, in order to fix this form? So we, we already fixed what components we want to have turned on by uh, in the gauge that we are uh, discussing. Um, but uh, yeah, don't some of so I, I just don't remember. Yeah, what they I, I'm getting to this now. So uh, these are not free. Um, they are they are n and m are uh, related to z and also to one another, depending on how you write this uh, subleading term here via the constraint equation. And I was going to write that down next. Okay. And and do matter fields uh, can matter fields in principle be modified in this expansion or whatever natural boundary conditions uh, or natural behavior at infinity matter fields have uh, will always preserve this form of the metric. Well, okay. So here you have an equation where on the left hand side you choose some boundary conditions for your geometry, and then on the right hand side you, you have some boundary conditions on the matter fields. If you want to th these equations to be satisfied. Uh, they're not. Uh, well, but uh, it's a, as you said, it's a delicate uh, question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, are dependent terms you can put? Because if you put uh, too strong falloffs, then uh, yes, then uh, then there's no solution, right. or it's so, infinite. So, so this is supposed to be an expansion that holds for most reasonable matter uh, going to infinity, or yes. But I don't know to what extent it captures all. Yeah. As always in this business of uh, choosing boundary conditions, I don't think you know uh, that you're not missing any interesting uh, situations by the choice that you made. The choice that Bondi van der Boog, Metz, and Sachs made allows, for example, for gravitational waves, which we can observe in our universe. And so there's one interesting class of uh, physically relevant situations that are captured uh, by this expansion. And there are many other uh, such uh, situations, um, but you could you know, think of something that is not captured by this. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a tricky business. Uh, to, it's a fine line between allowing more, solu more, uh, more solutions and uh, having those be physically sensible. I mean, should they allow for cosmic that's not in the That's one uh, question which we can come back to in uh, when I talk about super rotation symmetry. But yeah, that's, that's one question. I mean, what is interesting to you? <laughs> I don't fully agree with you. I just thought you said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if that's... Uh, I want to know how, how hypothetical... Can you repeat the question? Sorry. The, the question was, if this, is, this encompasses all physically interesting solutions, and uh, my short answer is, well, there are in other interesting solutions. How physical they are is maybe one question, but as Monica pointed out, 
uh, you can have cosmic strings and they will be uh, important when we want to uh, enhance the Lorentz symmetry to an infinite dimensional symmetry. And uh, yeah, and then maybe there are others if we want to further enhance that symmetry to a full diffeomorph um, full symmetry on the, on the two sphere. Yeah, but it's a delicate it business and there is a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, history. So um, cosmic strings break this, right? Sorry? Cosmic strings break these conditions. Yeah. Good. So I'm going to stick with the Bondi van der Burg, van der Burg Metzner, and Sachs uh, expansion uh, for the time being and then ask what, uh, what uh, asymptotic symmetries uh, the, the space times have. Okay, so now, but before moving on, um, I mentioned that not all these fields are independent. They are related by the constraint equation. So uh, let me write down what those are. So the time evolution of the Bondi mass aspect is related to uh, the Bondi news tensor. Maybe I should give, write the name here. This is the Bondi news tensor. It describes the news that uh, goes to the boundary. Um, Okay, so let me just write some explicit equations here. So notice that in the expansion that I'm writing, there are terms that are linear in the news and then terms that are quadratic. And then there are also uh, terms involving the matter fields. And then similarly for the angular momentum aspect, I have a term that is linear in the gravitational data. Then in the way that I've written this UZ component, um, the angular momentum aspect, uh, the change of it also contains the Bondi mass aspect, and then some terms that are quadratic. And then if, in order to specify uh, these falloffs, um, we need to uh, choose uh, the gravitational data, which we can uh, choose freely. And then NZ and M uh, are constrained via these equations. Um, now we also have to say a bit about how uh, they are restricted or what, what values they take as we go to the boundary of uh, null infinity. So what happens when we take U to minus infinity for in particular, and so we need to specify initial values for uh, these functions. Okay, so here we will be interested in uh, processes where we start in the vacuum and go back into the vacuum, and um, there's a long story about what kind of uh, constraints on the initial data of, uh, of the angular momentum aspect and the Bondi mass aspect uh, one should choose, and uh, that goes back to work of uh, Christo Dulo and Kleinemann and others. Um, which showed that there exists a class of uh, Cauchy data which dec decays sufficiently fast uh, at spatial infinity, so out here at I0, uh, such that the Cauchy problem leads to a smooth geodesically complete solution. And uh, one uh, condition here is that the total energy uh, is finite, and so uh, we need the news here to fall off uh, faster than one over u. So fall off as u to the one plus epsilon where epsilon is positive as u goes to plus or minus infinity. Um, and uh, m and n um, remain finite. Okay, so that, that here then contain, constrains the initial value uh, of ZZZ. And so now let me just write down what the- Sorry, Andrea, so, so this means what uh, Christo Rulo and company did uh, did not include the black hole formation because yes. then geodesically Indeed. complete. I, I, I said uh, is the idea that somehow these conditions that they found for the less interesting initial data would also apply to those mo more interesting uh, gravitational situations, like black hole formation? This condition or this condition holds? Yeah. 
uh, this condition or other conditions. Here I said I restrict myself to going from the vacuum to the vacuum, so I excluded already black hole formation. Um, I see, so, so I the boundary I conditions you're discussing are here, the initial only relevant for perturbative scattering, but not for generic quantum gravity in, uh, in flat space. These initial conditions that I, where I pointed out uh, one, uh, are not, do not uh, a priori apply to gravitational scattering, they apply to the going from the va vacuum to another vacuum. So I will not consider black hole formation in, in this course here. Uh, it's already uh, difficult enough to understand holography in a, in without uh, black holes or other uh, solutions that uh, uh, change the space time that much. But is it understood how to modify these conditions in, if, if one wants to define a gravitational phase space that would uh, be allowing for black hole formation? So this expansion uh, I can still use if I have a black hole in the bulk. Um, about this problem, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Um, so they used, they used this uh, analysis, for example, to show stability of Minkowski space. And uh, there's a lot of work about uh, to, to stability of horizons and black holes, so, black hole, right? sorry? So that stability of Minkowski to small enough perturbations that do not form a black hole. Yeah. Which sounds pretty restricted, right? Well, not every scattering process uh, creates a black hole. So there's many, many scattering processes that uh, will not but do that. Uh, I know you're interested in, in black holes, but there's many physical processes that do not. Well, we have black holes over the place. So they we have it all over the place, but we have scattering all over the place uh, okay. here on Earth where we don't have black holes <laughs> or in, like the, in our solar system where we don't have black holes. And so, you know, we can consider scattering without uh, without black holes too. And there is a rich story here, and uh, it's already uh, hard enough to understand what's happening near the boundary and whether there's a holographic uh, principle uh, at, uh, at work here. Uh, at the end of the day, we would have like, would like to, of course, understand uh, what happens when there are black holes too, but one step at a time. Um, there's surely a story about this here, but I'm not aware of it. Just a philosophical comment, I guess. I think a good notion of holography will predict when a black hole will form. So, so to be able to see in a formalism that mm -hmm. the black hole is inevitable at some point. As we will get to uh, at some point, uh, at this point, this celestial holography um, program is bottom up. It uses um, information about scattering amplitudes uh, in the bulk and then infers what the corresponding data is at the boundary. But of course, once we understand better what this uh, boundary theory is, then we hope to bootstrap and stuff and then we'll hopefully be able to understand, uh, make predictions about the bulk and that could include uh, black hole formation. But at this point, we're not, we're not there, so yeah. Okay, so um, now uh, for the last part of this uh, lecture, uh, I wanna now talk about the symmetries uh, of the space-time um, and then end, uh, end with their <coughs> interpretation. Please. Okay, let me, so there's two more things that I wanted to say here before I got a uh, couple of questions, which is that um, these fall-off conditions now um, constrain the initial value of uh, ZZZ, and um, I can use this to fix an integration constant. So I can uh, write the ZZZ near the boundary, let's say plus minus, since we are for now at future null infinity, is given by minus two DZ squared times some function. And so I can use this initial condition to um, uh, take the initial value of this uh, function C as my uh, initial data in the scattering process. And so now let me just write down uh, how the, what uh, determines the radiative data at the future uh, null boundary. It's given by the initial value of M of NZ. Um, of this function C that I just introduced, and then uh, NZZ, which still depends also on U. And all of them depend on uh, Z and Z bar. And so that is for square plus, and then I can write down a similar line for where plus and minuses are flipped, and 
this gives me the um, radiative theta at x prime minus. And these values of the, the these uh, values that I've written down here uh, will show up uh, in um, conserved charges that we are going to discuss now for the symmetries uh, of these space times. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, maybe I erase first. I'm still confused about your C, mm -hmm. because I guess both CZZ and CZ bar Z bar, uh, you, you have a single function C, right? Where yeah. you started with two. Um, yeah. This guy is this guy, and this guy is this guy. Uh, sorry, what's the second equation? Complex conjugate. No, the second. Oh. But, but still, uh, so you really don't have any transversality condition on the C, so like uh, the derivative on the sphere has to be something. I have some very vague memory, but maybe my memory. No, maybe. Be because initially, the way you introduce them, you have two independent functions. Um. I do remember a condition that relates DZ of well, one, one, oh, and I should have said, I, sorry, I didn't say this. This is the covariant derivative on the sphere. I, I, I mean, I, I guess when you have a gravitational wave going on, so when the news is in zero, you cannot take CZ bar Z bar to be the complex conjugate of CZZ, right? Is, is that correct? Or sorry, or say it again. If I have a gravitational wave, so I have a non-trivial U dependence of, uh, of this C function, Mm -hmm. can, can I still take that um, that complex conjugate condition that you wrote? Like, so the way that I've written it here is, I d yeah. For me, the z z bar z bar is the complex conjugate of z z z. So, so um, how many independent functions do I have? In terms of the z's. Uh, so at the end of the day, for the initial values, I just have z. And then I have uh, NZZ, which is still a uh, function of the But C is uh, complex or real? C would know indices. Mm -hmm. The whatever, member or whatever it's called, is it uh, real or complex? Uh, it's a function of CZ bar. At the end of the day, it should be real. Yeah, so, so, so there's a condition, function. yes, good. So there's a condition that uh, will make it real. But, but do you agree with me that initially CZZ and CZ bar Z bar were, uh, I mean, they should contain two pieces of data because for gravitational waves, when, when there's U dependence, yeah. you, you should have two independent functions. So here I have uh, ZZZ, and z bar, z z bar, z bar, which is uh, the right. so those complex are two conjugate. Independent functions. Mm -hmm. But now you've related them. So I'm asking. Uh, and. Uh, mm. Okay, let me think about this and get back to you later. We also haven't talked about the memory effect yet, so you're getting a bit ahead of yourself or of uh, ourselves, so maybe let's come back to that when we talk about the physics. Um, so I've written down for you over there um, the uh, Cauchy data that uh, specifies, uh, that specifies uh, the data at past and future null infinity, and now let me talk about the symmetries of the space-time. So uh, just as a reminder, we can have uh, isometries in space-time, and there the variation of uh, the metric along some flow xi, which is given by the leader derivative along this vector field xi, 
um, should be zero. Um, and this is then equivalent to the Killing equation satisfied by this vector field. And um, when such an isometry exists, then we can write down a conserved current, J, which uh, satisfies dj equals zero on shell. And so when we uh, take an integral over an arbitrary Cauchy slice, let me call it sigma, um, of this quantity, then we get a scalar quantity called the charge. And so for example, in Minkowski space, uh, which is homogeneous, um, this gives us uh, energy momentum conservation. So this is given by this integral over the zero uh, mu component of the stress tensor. And then we also have uh, Lorentz transformations where we get uh, angular momentum conservation. Okay, um, but uh, here in this asymptotic flat spines, we don't have exact uh, isometries, but we do have something and that's called asymptotic symmetries. Now these are not exact symmetries. Instead, um, the equation that I've written over there uh, gets modified in a way that we demand now the variation of the metric or the leader derivative of the metric to um, you demand this equation to be satisfied as we take um, the larger limit. Okay, so then um, the charges associated to this uh, vector field xi, they will be conserved only in uh, a region near the boundary where this is valid. Um, and so let me say a bit what asymptotic symmetry is. So um, asymptotic symmetry, since this is a symmetry that depends now uh, on the, uh, the coordinates, this is a gauge symmetry. And the symmetry parameter uh, is not a constant anymore, um, but it depends uh, on the coordinates. And if it falls off, uh, if it vanishes at the boundary, then we are back, back to a trivial gauge symmetry, which is a redundancy of the theory. But if the gauge parameter does not fall off sufficiently fast uh, at the boundary, then uh, the symmetry will change uh, the physical state. And so it's a real symmetry. So this would be, what's called a large gauge symmetry, as opposed to what we call small gauge symmetry when the gauge parameter falls off at the boundary and it's really just the redundancy of the theory, so it's trivial. Okay, so this then leads us to the definition of uh, what the asymptotic symmetry group is. Namely, it is the group of all the allowed uh, gauge symmetries, which in the case of gravity would be metamorphisms. Um, modded out by the trivial ones. So the trivial ones are those that give uh, redundancies that don't change the physical states while uh, the allowed symmetries do. And so this symmetry group um, extracts all the state changing transformations. And um, it's in that sense that it's the, the closest to a global, a global symmetry um, uh, in gravity where we don't uh, a priori have uh, global symmetries. But uh, once you, so once you specify um, a set of boundary conditions for your metric, you can ask what are the asymptotic symmetries uh, preserved by that metric, and then uh, from it compute what the asymptotic symmetry group is. And you can do this, um, this is not just uh, for gravity. You can also look at the asymptotic symmetry group of gauge theory. Um, so this is a more general concept, but we're gonna focus on gravity here. Okay, so uh, let me start by um, writing something down that uh, you all know, which is that 
in Minkowski space, um, the symmetry group of special relativity is the Poincaré group. And here we have that um, the metric theta mu nu satisfies this equation. And you have all seen the Poincaré generators, the generators of translations and Lorentz transformations in one set of coordinates, uh, although the Cartesian ones. Um, so now let me write it down for you in uh, the Bondi coordinates that we're using. So here we have this vector field xi. Um, so I'm solving for this vector field xi and get the following expression. So there will be um, derivatives with respect to the angles, the u coordinates and the r coordinates. And let me just write down this expression and then I'll explain it a bit. Okay, so that's um, the first part, which captures Lorentz transformations, and then the second part will capture translations. So for special values of this function f here, for example, f equals to one, um, will uh, correspond to um, triumph translations. Let me give this as uh, one. And then the other values of f, which uh, correspond to spatial translations. And let me just write uh, this down as an example. So this is a non-familiar form for um, how to write down translations, but this is what we get in this coordinate system. So you see it looks rather complicated while in Cartesian coordinates this looked very trivial. Okay, so for these values of, uh, of f, we get uh, the time and sp uh, spatial translations. And then there is in the first line, there is this uh, quantity y so y has some entries in some matrix, which I will not write down in um, lieu of time, but these entries go like uh, one, z, and z square, and the same with an i. And so there are six of them, and these six are exactly the rotations and boost of the Lorentz group. And now I'm gonna discuss uh, not just the uh, symmetries that are respected by this equation, but the symmetries that are respected by the equation that holds only near the boundary. So for this, what we have to do is we have to compute um, the leader derivative of the metric components. And what we need to do is we need to um, look at all the uh, diffeomorphisms of active fields xi, which preserve both the gauge conditions and the boundary conditions. So let me give us an example. Um, GRR equals zero was our uh, gauge condition. So uh, the, the leader derivative uh, of GRR with respect to xi should still exactly uh, satisfy this condition and the same also with the other components. So these should still hold. And then we had boundary conditions on the metric components that gave us the asymptotically flat metric and uh, these need to be preserved at uh, that order as well. So for example, the UU component, which was minus one plus one over R, so the change of that metric should still be order one over R. So we want to preserve the boundary conditions that we choose. And then when you solve for these vector fields uh, preserving these uh, conditions, you will find um, the asymptotic symmetries of uh, asymptotically flat spacetime. So I think, um, well, let me, let me continue to write uh, the rest of them. So these are the equations that you need to solve to get xi. And um, 
the solution for xi that solves these equations that I've written down on the board takes this form, the one that I've written here, but now f and y are no longer specified to take uh, particular values, uh, particular functions in terms of z and z bar, but they are arbitrary. Well, actually f is arbitrary, it's an arbitrary function of z and z bar now, and y, so y is now a vector field, y a, of z and z bar a priori, but it has to uh, satisfy the conformal killing equation on the two-sphere, which is this one. And um, the vector fields uh, that are uh, parameterized by f and y a um, are known as BMS uh, generators. So this is the analysis of both Bondi, Funderburg, Metzen, and Sachs. And or one can show, and we'll talk a bit more uh, next time, um, that these vector fields, these diffeomorphism vector fields, uh, indeed uh, generate for you symmetries of the gravitational scattering problem. Okay, um, maybe one of the last things that I write down is the, the algebra for the Lie bracket for these generators. So if I have a translation and a translation, the commutator zero. If I have a translation and a rotation, um, they don't commute, so I get another translation. And then if I have um, a rotation and another rotation, I get another rotation. Okay, so here I've talked about uh, translations and rotations, but actually what happens is because um, the, uh, the, these functions, the function f and the vector field y are no longer uh, fixed, they are completely arbitrary on the sphere, up to the fact that uh, y is has to satisfy the conformal killing equation. Um, the uh, translations and the rotations uh, will be enhanced, and because these are continuous uh, functions, they will be enhanced uh, infinitely. Um, one last point that I uh, wanna make here is that because y has to satisfy uh, this equation, um, one can show that the dz bar of yz has to vanish, and so that means y is holomorphic. Okay, um, and I think, how much time do I have left? Uh, you're at minus five minutes, but uh, we are flexible. Okay, can I take less than maybe five? But, but, but sorry, your, your wires are globally well-defined vector fields on the sphere, or not? So Y, if Y is globally, uh, I'm just getting to that. So if Y is globally well defined on the sphere, then uh, the only choices that I have is one Z, Z square, uh, and the same with an I. But uh, in principle, the question is, can you not allow for uh, more relaxed conditions? And the reason for that is that, let me just say, so we started out with uh, this vector field for this particular F, which gives translations. If f is an arbitrary function instead, you get an enhancement of translations to BMS super translations, which are now uh, angle dependent translations. So, uh, not, so, so there are, they are now infinitely uh, many more translations. And now you can ask, okay, get, does the Lorentz group maybe also get enhanced to infinitely many more? Um, if you, and original Bondi, Van der Metzen, and Sachs discarded them precisely because of the fact that you, the only uh, globally well-defined killing vectors are given by this. However, and so uh, Y is holomorphic. However, you can ask uh, what happens if I take YZ to be Z to the N for arbitrary N. And um, this was a good idea in studying uh, two-dimensional CFTs where we get a local enhancement of the global conformal group to Vera Soro if we allow for other Ns. So in particular, as an example, if I take YZ to be one over Z minus W, then uh, this equation tells me, well, not this equation, but the Z bar of YZ now becomes uh, a delta function, Z minus W, and so it's no longer uh, true that it's zero everywhere. It's no longer true that it's zero everywhere. Um, and so in particular, choosing this meromorphic vector field, which uh, goes like one over Z minus W, uh, violates um, the boundary conditions because if this is not zero, 
then one of the conditions that I wrote here, uh, L xi on uh, g z bar z bar, which is, uh, if you compute it, is given by 2 r square gamma z z bar d z bar y z, is now no longer zero, while it should be by, uh, in order to satisfy uh, the boundary conditions. So uh, there is a trade-off here. If you allow for uh, these meromorphic vector fields or even more general vector fields that uh, don't uh, uh, satisfy this equation being zero, either at isolated points on the sphere or everywhere on the sphere, you get enlargement of the Lorentz group. But the price to pay is that these uh, more general uh, vector fields no longer um, satisfy the Polov conditions. And so in order to uh, in order to make them really symmetries of the gravitational scattering and everything, you need to enlarge the phase space. And this is currently uh, a problem that's not fully understood. But what it gives you, it now gives you a local enhancement of uh, the global conformer group, which comes from the Lorentz uh, symmetry acting on the celestial sphere. And so this is something that uh, we would very much like to have if we, uh, uh, if we want to do holography in asymptotically flat space, because now our two-dimensional uh, theory on the uh, conformal boundary of Minkowski space would have a Verasora symmetry. Okay, so and next time um, we're going to talk a bit about um, uh, why these uh, vector fields give rise to symmetries, uh, how uh, they act on the physical data, which is given by um, these functions uh, z, n, and m, how uh, one could potentially observe these symmetries, and how they relate to uh, scattering and the thing that I started with in the beginning, which is soft terms um, in gravity. Okay, so let me then stop here. Okay, thanks, Andrea. Uh, are there any questions? Um, can you just repeat the comment about uh, uh, the arbitrary choice um, of Z line? Yeah, so if you um, pick um, for F of for translation, super translation or super rotations? For super rotation, okay. Okay, so um, if you wanna have a globally well-defined uh, vector field on the sphere, then this vector field should better be uh, one z z square. On the other hand, if you allow uh, other vector fields, like for example that one that I've written here, which is one example, what happens is that you no longer satisfy uh, the fall of condition, and that's because this vector field is now uh, not holomorphic, but it's it has uh, it has uh, at an isolated point when z equals w it no longer satisfies the boundary conditions. You could pick more general vector fields even, which are not a delta function, but which, which are some function, and then they would violate this fall of conditions everywhere on the okay, sphere. But, but so you are going to exclude historic direct no. Or no. So here, okay, let me just maybe also write this down. BMS super translations is what we will consider. And this is for an arbitrary f. And then we will consider um, this is then called extended BMS group, which will include super rotations. And those are when you take YZ not just to be uh, one of the global, uh, globally well-defined killing vectors, but uh, you allow for choices um, that violate the falloffs either at isolated points or much later on, we will also talk about vector fields that violate them everywhere, um, which enhances the Virasora symmetry, which you would get from a, from a vector field like that, uh, to DFS2. And we will talk about the relation between the two uh, later on. And so this is, at this point, maybe still an outstanding question. What is the asymptotic symmetry group of Einstein gravity uh, at null infinity? And um, the, the question about, uh, about the phase space that you would have to enlarge in order to include um, changes of the metric at leading order um, is one that's not uh, settled. 
So at this point, this is a very interesting avenue and we're gonna pursue it and see what, uh, where it leads us. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe one other thing here is that um, we will also see in the next lecture that um, cho choices of these vector fields that go beyond the globally well-defined killing vectors um, will give us a relation to the subleadings of graviton theorem. So the second term in the expansion that I showed in the very beginning. Um, and so these two are maybe on a less well-defined footing as the leadings of graviton theorem and the BMS symmetry because for those these things are settled. But uh, there is um, um, a counterpart of the enhancement of super rotation symmetry, uh, which is connected to um, a universal piece in the soft expansion of gravitational scattering. So. And for 50 or more years, this was excluded. But then recently, um, people thought maybe it's a good idea to follow the same kind of uh, uh, steps as in, in CFT, where this was, uh, in 2D CFT, where this was a very useful undertaking. Um, I have a question. So since you're mentioning the connection of these uh, super rotation enhancements to uh, a subleading soft theorem for the graviton, is mm -hmm. there anything comparable for the photon? Or for the so yes, so in for the photon case, there's the leadings of the photon theorem or the leadings of gluon theorem, um, which is related to charge conservation at every angle. Um, there exists a large gauge symmetry uh, for uh, the Maxwell field as well. Um, yeah, m maybe I'll, I'll mention a bit uh, next I, time. I, I, yeah, but I was referring specifically to subleading. Yes, so I was just about to say that. There's also a subleadings of photon and a subleadings of gluon theorem, and it's uh, on the same footing as the sub subleadings of graviton that I didn't show, uh -huh. in the sense that there isn't uh, a full fledged asymptotic symmetry interpretation. There have been works by uh, Campilia and Lada in trying to understand this most subleading uh, universal terms uh, as asymptotic symmetries, but the gauge parameter is not uh, finite at the boundary, it's, it's diverging in R. So, and there's actually beyond these most subleading uh, soft terms which don't have a clear cut asymptotic symmetry interpretation, there exists infinitely many more, uh, which we'll come back to when we have introduced a bit of uh, celestial holography uh, tools, um, and they give rise to an interesting symmetry group in the, uh, by which I mean a symmetry for uh, the celestial analog of the S matrix, um, but the asymptotic symmetry interpretation is at this point not, uh, not understood for those. An uh, urgent question. Okay. Uh, Can I ask a question here from sorry, I virtually? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Andrea, it's Brando. Um, so in, usually, so in flat space without gravity, we classify the the states in neighbor space with representation of Poincaré. Now, just because gravity exists, it seems that the synthetic group is large, much large. Should we actually think, should we actually label the states in the Hebrew space in terms of representation of the, of the, of the BMS group, or, or, is, or this is misleading, or does it bring anywhere? No, I think this is a very good question. And uh, there has been some uh, initial work on that when recasting the uh, S matrix in the basis where it looks like a, a correlation function. OK, thank you. I know that some groups have been uh, thinking about these questions, um, but I don't think their work is out yet. Yeah. Sorry, Brando, uh, are you done with your question? Sorry, I don't yeah, have a better no, answer to your question. Yeah, 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 thank you very much. Yeah. So, so, so is the status that the uh, group theory of the BMS group is not fully fledged? Is that the status or? Um, okay, so 
there is the GR aspect of it and uh, BMS group and uh, constructing charges using the canonical Hamiltonian formalism and so on and so forth. For BMS itself, I think it's pretty well understood. For extended BMS, uh, it's much less understood. Um, in particular, the question about enlarging the phase space. And then um, the question of applying this to talk about the S matrix and scattering uh, is yet another question. Um, and only in the last few years, the connection has been made between uh, certain limits of the S matrix and these asymptotic symmetries. So I think it's very much a, a work in progress. I mean, this, this field is huge. It, it, the, the communities that uh, there, there's Asymptotic symmetries, this is more than 50 years old. Soft terms are more than 50 years old. And then uh, in the last 10, 15 years, connections have been made between them. And then there's the, the other field of memory facts, which is also 40, 50, yeah, it's also the 70s. Okay, so we have a time frame of these three different fields that come together, which all have a long, long history. Um, and uh, yeah. The process of connecting them is one of the last couple of years. So, yeah. Okay. 